Hello, my name is Laura Mosqueda. I'm the Dean of the Keck School of Medicine, and I'm delighted that we can show you what the next phase of your training could look like. July 1st is a very exciting day. It's when I welcome our new interns, residents, and fellows. The amount of exposure that we get as students at LA County and Keck and all these different sites is incredible. Good morning, Mr. E. Oh, do you have the CT scan? Yeah. Let's pull up that CT scan. This is the CT scan from the first day. We are smack in the middle of it all, right here uh, in this health sciences campus. So we have a county hospital right across the street that has incredible, not only inpatient, but ambulatory facilities. Right across the street in the other direction, we have our Keck Hospital with wonderful ambulatory and outpatient surgery sorts of facilities. Then on my right, we have our Norris Comprehensive Cancer Hospital. And then just across the street, we have our major research buildings too. This week, in fact, we've had a sickle cell patient, an aplastic anemia patient who came for treatment. We get uh, TTP patients. We have three to five autologous stem cell transplant patients on at any given time. I've been here 44 years, and there's two common foundational principles. Number one, patient interest supersedes self-interest. This is absolutely critical. You're Levels are coming down, looking good. Um, so you're thinking discharge? Yeah, I think you can go home today. Yes. <laughs> the second is that this is a teaching center, and we talk about the very famous professors that are here to teach you. But the one thing everybody learns is that the master teachers are the patients themselves. And so, sir, we're going to show you what you actually had before and after. OK. okay? This is what Ooh, you came in with. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you came in with. <laughs> Nearly locked out that entire lung, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You must have a passion. Part of your mission is to take care of the underserved. We are serving the underserved. We are serving those that are more socioeconomically advantaged. But essentially, you want to serve everyone and everybody and serve them the same regardless of who they are. So who's our next patient? In here? Yep. Go Let's go. These are the patients that, you know, it's not just a pleasure to serve, it's an honor to serve. They're my people. It's, I see myself reflected in the, in the population. I really wanted to come back home in more ways than one. This could be my mom. This could be my dad. This could be my uncle. Um, and no other place could afford me that opportunity besides here. It's been a, the most challenging and rewarding thing I've done in my life, being here. Uh, I've been pushed in ways that I didn't think were possible. We're looking for that spark, that spark in a person that's going to become a good physician who's going to put the patient first. Because like, oh, I don't know if that would be, you know? No, so uh, tran an exudative mm -hmm. does not automatically become empyema. Mm -hmm. It's the white camp. Got it. Part of patient care is not just using what you know, but it's how you treat the patient, both medically and clinically and physically and emotionally. Can we get Dr. Dix in here, please? Can we get some backup? No matter how dramatic this scenario is, it's something that happens. It takes about eight months till you start thinking, I can do this, I can master this. We pride ourselves on having the same physicians who work in both of the hospitals I've just described. So we want to give one standard of care for every patient that comes in the front door. I want to get exposed to as much as possible, do as much as I can, and kind of be as honest with myself. This is not a movie, this is for real. Can you show us two fingers? It's really important that not only do they listen to what the attending has to say, but equally important, the attending needs to listen to what the resident has to say. Show me where your pain is. We're here to learn. There's no dumb questions ever. One of the great things is that as a resident and even as a fellow, I feel very comfortable asking questions. You know, the model is like no dumb questions, right? 
It's so important to know that you're part of the Trojan family. That's not just a catchphrase here, it's something that we really need. We care about the people who are here. We care about you after you leave. It's a lifelong commitment on our part I'm Joelle Gutragman, and I'm one of the first-year surgical critical care fellows. We have five first-year fellows, one burn fellow who rotates with us for part of the year, and then in the second year, we currently have three fellows, but we'll ha be having four second-year fellows from now on. So it's a total of 11. All of our fellows have completed a residency in general surgery and have decided to go on and pursue additional training in surgical critical care and acute care surgery, uh, which also includes trauma. Uh, the first year of our fellowship focuses mainly on surgical critical care, meaning that we spend the majority of our time in the ICU, learning how to manage critically ill surgical patients, whether they be liver transplant patients or trauma patients. Uh, during that time, we're also fortunate enough to take trauma surgery call, so we take about four calls a month. And then the second year is devoted completely to acute care surgery and trauma. It's a really fast-paced job. Um, you have to think minute to minute, change your plans second to second. Uh, we all come in armed with a strong foundation and knowledge of trauma, but we're lucky to be training in the epicenter of it all. The people we work for literally wrote the book on it, and uh, it takes somebody who's willing to change their decisions uh, in, at the blink of an eye, somebody who's willing to get messy, somebody who's willing to be really emotionally invested in what they do because the highs are really high and the lows are really low. Um, you're dealing with the sickest, most injured patient population possible, but um, when they do well, it's, there's no greater feeling in the world. Trauma is lovely in that it's algorithmic, but it also uh, allows for a lot of opportunity for creativity. So everything we do from the second that a patient hits the door follows a basic algorithm put out by the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma called Advanced Trauma Life Support. And then wherever your patient kind of leads you in the algorithm is where you have to make decisions. So starting from their airway, going to their breathing, going to their possible sources of bleeding, you kind of have to evaluate each one quickly, knowing that if anything changes about the patient, we have to start from the top and reevaluate the entire thing. No two injuries are exactly the same. No two humans' anatomies are exactly the same, but uh, we have this fortunate thing here that you know we do see such high volumes of trauma that the pattern recognition becomes second nature and we have people with years of experience who are able to help get us to the place where we get those patterns we see those patterns we can anticipate the next move residency i did general surgery which is the precursor for trauma that everybody has to do i knew as a medical student that i was interested in trauma um, it was my first uh, surgical experience that i had as a medical student and from the first day I remember just bouncing up and down, waiting for the next, uh, the next trauma to arrive. It really is very well suited for like an adrenaline junkie, fast paced kind of person, which fits most of us. <laughs> somebody who is motivated, somebody who's thirsty, somebody who wants to train with the best of the best and become a leader in the field, this is the program that shapes you into that. We have the tools in every way. We have the amazing mentors and connections who constantly are traveling around the world, speaking at meetings, writing textbooks, who take you under their wing and allow you to be a part of that. Um, our department is incredibly prolific in terms of our research and publications, and uh, I myself am on like five or six different projects right now that people are um, constantly asking us to participate in and um, taking us you know, in on. And um, the exposure that we have, I mean, you know, it's not lost on us any day that we're in a place with a lot of gang violence, a lot of high-speed car accidents. There's a lot for us to uh, take care of here. The first year we divide our time between county and Keck, and the second year we're only at county. There's two options that you can do for the fellowship. The first is that you could do a one-year program, and the second is you could do a two-year program. Regardless of which one you choose, the first year is always the same. It's the surgical critical care year, and the second year um, is the additional year that focuses on acute care surgery and trauma. We wrote, spend one month of the first year rotating in the burn ICU. It's a really interesting experience. A lot of general surgery residents don't get to rotate in a burn unit during their five years as a resident. So for us, it just provides one more thing that we gain experience on and know how to take care of. Burns and trauma are really frequently associated with each other. Um, if you can imagine, you know, cars 
crashing into each other, obviously things get pretty hot. Um, even people falling on hot pavement in the summer, if they're struck by a car or something, can cause burns. So you don't necessarily think about those things, explosions, terrible accidents. Um, so it's really good to work closely with those people and learn um, even more skills that are going to arm us in the future to be the most well-rounded surgeons we can be. When the trauma is activated, we have trauma team activations. The uh, a trauma fellow on call and the attending on call will get a notification on their pager that a trauma is coming to the ER. There's certain criteria that are set by the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and expanded upon by us to define what meets uh, an activation. So when one of those is activated, we'll get a little blurb about what it is so we can prepare on our way down. And then when we will go to the ER to evaluate that patient and take it from there. Dr. Dimitriades, who has been here for many, many years, uh, actually wrote the Atlas on Emergency Surgery and Trauma, where it, you know, using his years and years of experience, details, this is how you open someone's chest in the emergency department to perform a resuscitative thoracotomy. This is how you do a you know, midline sternotomy for um, a heart injury. This is how you do an exploratory laparotomy for a gunshot wound. Every single little thing you could think of with all his tips and tricks and pitfalls that he's accumulated throughout the years uh, is in that book. Him and Dr. Anab are just such incredible, you know, resources and people to work with. Uh, been, you know, everybody who does surgery, whether you go into trauma or not, knows who these people are. They're really the leaders in the field and, it's kind of like, you know, people tell you you're going to move to Los Angeles and meet all these celebrities. For us, the people that come here, like, those are the celebrities <laughs> that we're meeting. And the first couple of times I would see them in the office, I'd kind of be like, oh, my God, I work for you. I can't believe I work for you. But um, the experience is just invaluable. You know, scrubbing in with Dr. Dimitriades at 3 o'clock in the morning on, on a gunshot wound to the abdomen, and you think, oh, it's not, this can't possibly work, or how am I going to do that? And then you watch him do it, and it works every single time. You can't read that in a book. You can't, you know, get that any other way than getting mentored by these people. Actually, all of our fellows were fortunate enough to participate in an episode of Grey's Anatomy this year, which was super fun. Totally different than what we do every day, but uh, we had a great time. It was actually really nice, you know, they would say, uh, when I make this incision, how would you really, you know, how would you cut the chest? And we'd say, oh, well, if you think about it, you know, you want to curve your incision, you're kind of following the shape of the rib, and they're like, oh my god, that makes so much sense, thank you so much. And it was really uh, fun how they looked for us for our input and, like, took it into account. We have the best fresh tissue dissection lab in the world because we're not only fortunate enough to have a large volume of fresh cadavers, but we actually perfuse our cadavers as well. Um, we have a wonderful um, teacher, Michael Minetti, who runs the Fresh Tissue Dissection Lab in conjunction with several of our faculty. Uh, they are able to insert cannulas into the blood vessels of these um, cadavers, and they can either put a fluid resembling blood or air that gets circulated through the cadaver, similar to you know, any of us living, breathing human beings. So this allows us for very, very realistic dissection opportunities. Because if you think about it, you know, when it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm with Dr. Dimitriades, and even, you know, someone like him who's the best teacher ever can't really slow down and say, now, Joelle, to get to the blood vessel under here, we have to take off a piece of the clavicle. You can't really slow that down in an emergency. But in the FTDL, we can do that all day long and take as much time as we need and really hone in on these difficult, um, precise exposures that we're expected to learn how to do in trauma. I, you know, we get to go every week. We have a whole set curriculum. It's an invaluable experience. It's really as realistic as it gets. And actually, even more realistically, usually we go in as a group of us, and it's nice because we never get to operate together. So it's nice we all work together and teach each other. And the second year fellows who have, just by being here for a year before us, have already gained so much experience to help us with these exposures. But a couple times a year, they'll put us in a scenario each individually in which they have the patient hooked up to a monitor that they can control with the computer. Um, and they ha are filming us doing it so we could watch ourselves after and see what we did. So they'll say, this is a patient who got stabbed in the leg and you're the only one, your partners are all busy doing other cases, go. And you walk in and this patient's leg is pumping blood across the room wow. and the monitor's beeping and you're sweating and they put an Apple watch on us and measure our heart rate <laughs> through the whole yeah. thing. It's a little embarrassing, um, but I think my heart rate was like 120 beats a minute. And uh, we, yeah, so you really get to like simulate what this crazy, scary trauma experience is like. And 
watch yourself after and be, you know, mortified, but it's a great learning experience. I did one, um, the main artery in the leg was transected, right? So I had to repair that and it was so damaged that I had to just put a piece of plastic tubing from one end to the other to make sure that the leg got blood flow. So that was on a Friday. The next day I took call on a Saturday and I had someone get shot in the arm, went through his arm and into his belly. And I had to do the same thing because I was alone on the arm and my boss was in the belly. And if, you know, and I just did exactly what I had learned the day before and I was able to do it by myself, no problem. So, we're, you know, I don't, there's no other trauma fellowship in the country that has that available to them. Here, we have an amazing thing every year that we have our trauma survivor reunion, where we have patients come back year after year um, that connect with us and we can connect with their families and they can connect with each other and, um, you know, as they go through the recovery of their traumas, build these amazing support networks and it's an awesome thing that we have. I think that um, our biggest strength is each other. We have um, you know, this built-in friend group of fellows, and I really think that when they choose people for this fellowship, they really think about how people are going to get along with and interact with each other. Uh, we all hit the ground running, and we're super close from the get-go, and nobody, you know, no matter how close you are with your significant other or your family or your other friends, nobody is gonna get it like your co-fellows get it. The department publishes over 50 publications easily every year. We have um, extremely academically productive attendings, whether it be Dr. Dimitriotti's Trauma Atlas, which we all helped contribute to the next edition of the book and each edited and wrote our own chapters, um, or submitting research to be presented at meetings. I know I um, individually just got accepted to the two major surgical meetings up this upcoming fall. Um, we have our own conference every year, our trauma symposium here, which I think is in its over 25 years, uh, where we have the opportunity to present to hundreds of people as fellows annually. Um, so the department is very productive and no matter kind of what your niche is, there's a way for you to get involved and join this academic community. Uh, in terms of teaching, uh, we are fortunate enough that we get to have teaching rounds with Dr. Dimitriades every day. This is the cornerstone of the uh, educational aspect of the fellowship. And then we also have lectures twice a week um, that are often performed by us. So we get the opportunity to build a portfolio of lectures, journal clubs, and also um, get taught by our co-fellows. One of the things about doing a fellowship at a, a you know, big illustrious trauma center like this is learning how to run a trauma center. There's a ton of stuff from an administrative standpoint that goes into uh, being verified to be a level one trauma center like we are, which is the highest level that you can be, um, and maintaining that. So we have to constantly be reflecting on our own statistics and the things that uh, things and practices that we have here to make sure that we're offering the best care and uh, maintaining the set standards. So um, each fellow is given several quality improvement projects where we look every month at um, the months preceding and see where we are in terms of um, how we manage our um, deep vein thromboses or how we prevent central line infections or um, our high, very highly injured patients, how did their outcomes turn out? So we all know how to do these procedures in particular, you know, the big famous highlighted one is the resuscitative thoracotomy where if a patient comes in in cardiac arrest or goes into cardiac arrest in front of us in the trauma bay, we will open their chest and manually try to get their heart restarted um, or fix whatever bleeding injury is in there. We will put a clamp across the aorta to maintain blood flow to the head and we have a pretty good success rate at this institution of getting these patients, you know, more than the national average, bringing these patients literally back to life and up to the operating room we'll frequently do acute care surgery. You know, we do em emergency general surgery also, so we're taking out gallbladders and appendixes. You know, so they vary in how sick they are, and part of the job is triaging what needs to go first, and you have one or two ORs for the day, and you need to figure out, you know, where you're putting everybody. It's kind of like finishing school fellowship. You know, you're going out from being a resident where you could just go and work to kind of refining this place you're gonna fit into in the surgical world, and you know, really honing in on those skills. We actually have um, a very close relationship with the armed forces. So typically one fellow per class, so currently one first year and one second year fellow are actually active duty armed forces. Um, they're active duty army and um, we work, you know, side by side with them like the rest of the fellows. There's no difference in them. We also have um, 
a Navy trauma training center here, and we have active um, duty Navy faculty. So we get a lot of interesting perspective from these people because they've actually seen combat, and they know. You know, we will have people from the Navy come and do. Uh, stuff in the FTDL and the tissue lab. They'll come to our teaching rounds and they just offer us this completely unique perspective of the way that they do things. Fortunately, we are very, very well connected. Um, we have, you know, graduates from this program all over the globe, let alone all over the country. And it's a small world, the trauma world. So, um, not, you know, not only do I have to peruse the jobs that are posted with our, within our different societies on their websites, but um, you know, if I'm curious about an opening in a particular institution or opportunities in a particular city, my mentors um, will reach out to those places and see if they have anything available. Once you've done a residency or a fellowship here, you are ready for the next phase of your career. And that might be going into clinical practice, it might be going into academia, it might be going on for more training, whatever it is, be assured that you are going to be the most well-prepared person possible for that next part of your career.